Ammonites of the Odyssean, that's what the piece is called. Okay? But when I took part and worked with Art Shape, it was space between, and the work I made that I'll show you is talking about that. And this piece also talks about the space between September 2006 and 2016. One of the reasons I chose that, and I chose 24 divisions, because there's 24 books in the Odyssey, and the Odyssey took place over 10 years. So that's the picture. It's over there on the wall, and I'm going to take some of it apart for you. Ram's horns, snake stones, and conger eels. Okay, you probably don't know what I'm talking about, but I'm talking about ammonites. These. You probably recognize that. They haven't been to bet too, they're looked at and revered and things like that. So an ammonite is a fossil. What's a fossil, you say? A fossil is the remains or the trace of an animal and plant that have been preserved by natural causes in the crust of the earth. Okay? We use these to look back into the past. They're our windows. You know, why do we look back into the past? Why do we need to learn stuff? This is my granddad. In fact, 101 years ago on this Friday, he signed up at the age of 16. He was a naughty boy. He didn't go and fight till 2017. Curiously, tomorrow he was sent 100 years ago. We look at the past because we can learn stuff from the past, hopefully, but we also remember. Here's a little bit of a family tree just to show you a diagram from my other side of the family. So we can work out where we come from, and it's really important to know where we come from, to know where we are, and also to look into the future. So this is one of the main elements of the diagram. It's 24 different events, and they're marked through 10 years of time. So where they were important, where they started, where they finished. And I'll go through a few of them. Some of them I won't tell you about, and some of them I will. So at the bottom of the diagram are two sets of this. Now I trained as a geologist. I didn't train as an artist. And the reason I trained as a geologist was when I was 10, a teacher tore a picture up in front of the class and said, you're stupid, you'll never be in Do you know why? I would spelled my name wrong. I'm dyslexic. It wasn't talked about as being dyslexic in 1970. You were thick, stupid, idiot, retarded, idiot, thick, whatever. You name it, never dyslexic. So I thought that I couldn't do anything. I wanted to keep my drawing to myself. I went and did my other love, which is geology. So all of the names for all of the different events that I've put on that diagram are termed in proper geological language. There are a few given away in there, but they're all in Latin and Greek. But they all mean something really specific from a personal part of my life. And there's a lot of my personal <coughs> the life in there as well as the artistic one because I can't separate them. So what did I do before Art Show? I was a book illustrator. I hid at home because I didn't want to talk to people because I learned from that day at school that people have the power to hurt me. So I chose and I didn't go and do geology as a career because I didn't fancy working on an oil. I wanted to work in museums, and I went and temporarily worked in a museum, and someone was vile to me, so I didn't want to do that anymore, because they didn't understand my motives. Because, as it turns out, as an autistic person, I have set motives, and when people say I have other motives, I get very upset. This is when I found out I was dyslexic in 1999, I drew this. But bearing in mind all my work before Art Shape was 2D, although I'd always wanted to make 3D work. Again, 2000, this is reacting literally to a brief from an arts organisation saying a letter of the alphabet. So I chose letter A, and everything is made out of letter A's, even in the background. We autists like things literal. <laughs> I still do diagram it diagrams and drawing. I like taking ordinary things and repurposing them, and I've done that from when I was a little child. And that's probably one of the latest ones, but that's relevant to something I'm going to tell you here. So, Archer, what did I do? 
I made this. Now, it was talking to Zoe. I was just starting on a residency at the University of Portsmouth, which was run by an outside arts organisation, because I wanted the chance to go to art college. I've never been. And there I was, 45, and I thought, let's test what I want to do in an arts context. If they like it, it might be all right. If they don't like it, I'll pack up and go home. So I wanted to make a couple of objects. But what I made were two pieces that I submitted to Art Shape for their oh, exhibition well. space between. This piece is copper, it's a map of Cornwall using copper, found in Cornwall, and granite found at each of the individual places that they represent on the geological map. So the granite bursts through, but it's all written in grey, the numbers and distances between each granite outcrop. Underneath they're all one, but they break through the surface. And this was a piece that was bought by Salisbury Art Gallery. It's also on there because it makes a reappearance. It reappeared in 2015 because someone found it in the collection and based an exhibition around it. They had spoken to me for six months on Twitter. They had suddenly realised it was me who did that piece of artwork. And I went and did a show with that, where I put a stone circle down and showed some other geological influence art. AA to A, what I've just told you about, my residency at the University of Portsmouth. I started making physical objects. This is my actual school pen from school. I kept my cheap things. That's another unfortunate aspect of yes. I also twisted different sorts of diagrams. So this was done in 2007. It's called Six Million Dollar Man because I was inspired by someone who told me they were bullied at school. He had hearing aids and they called him the six million dollar man because he also wore other things and they put him back together. But the whole thing works like the proper diagram, the proper periodic table. So all the words and elements actually line and go towards something. I like being very naughty. I would put these up in different places. People don't notice things if you put them in plain sight. But this was the other piece I made that went on, on show with Art Shape. And both of these were made to touch. And this one described my attitude to reading because you can't see it, but there's a bolt at the far end. But I've given people a spanner, but unfortunately the spanner doesn't reach. And it echoes chained libraries like the ones in Gloucester, etc. Where language, you know, before we had to write, dyslexia was a problem and our talents could be shown but people judge us by our inability to read, write, short-term memory, and our talents don't get shown. Just like people in, in medieval times who couldn't read and write and wanted to, but others kept it to preserve the dead. I finished my A to A residency, and I went on and I got a leave of human grant, and they kept me at the university. And what I was, what I was doing was making music from supernovas. So I made a whole set of music so I don't just draw, I don't just make, I make music as well. I started getting very interested in my childhood and events that happen that change your life. So looking at a supernova, suddenly this star goes bang. You know, what we have on Earth, we have atomic weapons. Very, very similar. Both those moments you can't go back. So if you look at your childhood, my teacher tearing my picture up, I can't go back and fix it. It's a moment where things change forever. So in that picture I was maybe nine, I was happy. I didn't know what was going to go on and happen to me next. I also made a whole series of star maps, but I made these from the pants of chewing gum at Brighton Station. I asked for permission and they said no, never asked for permission. It's always easy to do it and apologise. So I made all these star maps. I was sorry to have photographed it and made all these star maps. When I was 10, when that teacher was tearing my picture up, when I was bullied in class, I used to go and sit outside, lay on the grass and watch the stars. And these are exactly the same as the book that I had then. Or when I did the names all at random, that one's called The Uncanny Lima. Google's great for doing random things on Wikipedia. I also made a stone circle that played music. I like stones, stones are my friends. And there was a stone that went round and banged against the other ones and generated music. 
So all these were part of a couple of exhibitions that I actually called the ordinary things, funny enough. <laughs> I'm interested in circles, so I set this circle up, and as well as having the atomic bomb on the wall, and the, the, I played music, and then when people were in the room, I suddenly changed it to a transmitter, to the original announcement, the dropping of the atomic bomb. Some people left, they got worried. I like playing with people. But nobody would go into the circle and ring the bell in the middle, except for one Chinese chap who just strode in, walked across it, rang it and went. It's cultural, we don't like overstepping boundaries. So there we go, that was you know, social model, little boy, dis yes. So you'll recognise this because that music got played in the taste of one point, along with a load of seagull sounds and a yellow line that you can't see that I stuck down and promised them that I wouldn't mark the floor in any way. But when I took it up, it cleaned it. <laughs> you can see it in Jeremy Dale's video, but it's now got rid of because they read the floor. Goose on the Hill. I was making maps of people's journeys. This one actually isn't. This is my favourite because this was banned by the train company because it's actually a systemisation of all the bags caught in the trees between Barnum and East Coast. Yes, it got me my autism diagnosis. <laughs> but I got the chance to play, and remember that dyslexia book cover? I put that up at the wall in um, London Bridge on the Shard. You know, we got to play. Playing in public is great. You know, you don't have to be a public artist to play in public. But by doing it, you are. Someone earlier mentioned dream. I use dream as the motif for the project. And one of the things I told Arts Council I was going to do was going to get words in timetables. You can't get words in timetables because they're legally prescribed. But if you chat the person up who's making the timetable who's quite disgruntled and wants to leave, <laughs> he put dream in the margin for me because I'm a marginalised artist. 104,000, they pulled some. It led to a little bit of friction because people wrote in and said it was a spelling mistake. <laughs> But also at Talent House, they turned around to me and said, if we gave you the chance for an exhibition, what would you do? And I said, off the top of my head, I'll do a geological interpretation of my life. So that's what I did. Geological diagrams in an art magazine, yeah, they got complaints. This shouldn't belong in here. But that's actually a geological diagram of my entire life. And a geological diagram of Chichester. So you can turn anything about on itself and use another as a metaphor. There's another autism myth broken. We don't understand metaphor. So here we go, looking at the layers when I was 11, when I was 22. The reason I say there was an art evolution event when I was 22 is because I worked at the Barbican Art Gallery as a security guard because I wanted to be near pictures and on my own. And one particular exhibition was unboxed and I saw them unbox it. They hung right upside down for a while until I pointed them out. But they were abstract pictures. It didn't taste right, so I said that's wrong. And they checked and it wasn't. And I could hear this exhibition, I could taste the pictures, I could touch them in my head, and I thought, I've got to do what I said I would do when I was six, and what I said I'd do when I was six is I would be an artist. Didn't do it from there, I did it from here. I am innately an artist. So there you go, there's you know, one of the order of things illustrations that I did. Um, this was on show at Taunton back in 2010, where I put a giant dinosaur on the wall in common. And I made music. I made a whole suite of music from the banging of a lock gate at Port Leven Harbour in Cornwall. I like taking things and repositioning them and turning them into something else. Look about. Someone I gave a dream sticker to to go and stick on the train to make people think. It happened to be someone from the Cultural Olympiad. So she came to my show, my geological interpretation of my lifetime was showing the work I did with the rail company, came out and said, we might have a commission for you. And what it ended up doing, I won't go into a lot of it, was I was to map the cultural activity of deaf and disabled artists in the southeast. Now, instead of just doing that as a project, I said, well, how about if I go to all these things, but I map my time 
go in to see all these things and then use that as an influence to create a geological map. Arts Council said yes, Accentuate South East Decommissioning me said yes. So I spent four years of my life writing everything down I did every day. It's about two million minutes. I have a pile of notebooks and thousands of pieces of paper. It's probably about two miles long if I lay it into it. Yes. <laughs> I also collected fossils. Half of my studio is full of boxes of fossils. Fossils, I mean things that remind me of that event. And I traced evolutionary lines of hair groups. This was at Liberty Festival 2011. Uh, they invited me to do the pillar wraps. I hid things in the woods. We won't go any further than that. But there's the geological map. It finally came out in 2015. That's four years of my life. I need to write a monograph to go with it. Yes. Disarticulate. That's number 19 on there. At the same time as I was doing the trains, I thought, OK, everybody's looking out the window. We're looking at their feet. If we did something weird in a the field, they might look at it. What's a cheap, weird thing to do? Make loads of fags. How do we do that cheaply? We get old books and we get kebab sticks and stick the two together and we make fields of these flags. So I thought, okay, let's test it out. And I went down to the beach of East Sneak and I started putting these little flags out to see what they did. And it's like the deserted end of Portsmouth where I live. No one goes there. Suddenly this van turns up, all these people get out. They're traffic wardens. That's where they go to have their lunch. <laughs> Away from everyone else. I wonder why. So they said, what are you doing? Can we join in? So the first flag field was done by traffic wardens, which is ironic because when I was unemployed in 2004, they wanted to make me a traffic warden and I told them where they could put it, not politely, and to send me on a self-employed course. We then got asked to do it at Whistable Banali, so we went and did it at Whistable Banali. It took off, it got seen, and London 2012 funded it for 2011. This is actually not 2011, this is 2013. I was asked to go and do it back again in Queen Elizabeth Park for one of the celebrations and we planted about 6,000. We did it for the torch relay. We had some of the schools in Hampshire do it and I think they made about 60,000. And then we planted uh, about 6,000 on Fratton Park's football ground with special permission so the torch could go in and out. But the reason I made this project happen, it was taken up, it got an inspire mark, was that anybody can do it anywhere. It's relevant, like Marvis work. You know, you could make a, a, an installation without being an artist. You could be an artist for the day. I wanted people to join in. You know, you get your dad's favorite book, you plant it in his favorite place. You take a book that's relevant. You know, taking a book apart is difficult, but if it's that landfill, I'd rather because of repositions and done. I love books. Books are my friends. So we have people around the country do it. You know, people set up flag making workshops in chip shops and scout hangs. And we, we, we got many thousand made. You know, it was about getting people to engage. What they didn't know was the conversations they had while they were making them. That was the art. Planted some at Parliament. Oh, that's relevant in a minute. I'll go back a bit. Confirm, which is number 10 on there. I came here in 2011 to talk at Shelton Science Festival. Someone had heard about my geological mapping project and said, would you come and do a talk with us? And at that point, I suspected I was autistic. They said, would you come and show some of your work alongside a couple of other people? And I said, yes. They didn't tell me who, they didn't say where. Two months later, I get an email, Chelton Science Festival, Simon Baron Cohen. Oh, okay. Sold out already. Well, that wasn't down to me. Um, so I showed my work, along with a guy called Ben Connors and Gabriel. Gabriel is sad in that with us anymore, but Ben, I'm working with him still. And after the, the talk and the question and answer session, Welcome Trust came on stage straight away and said, you two should work together. And I'm thinking, he's the leading autism researcher. What does he want to do with me? And he said, yes. So that's what we did. We called the project Confirm. 
This is the first day in Cambridge I was late. Disaster for us. What happened was I saw this wonderful yellow line, white line on the pavement and it had cracked and I had to photograph it all. Yes, and I turned it into artwork and it was the start of me doing digital artwork. I have a lot of trouble painting because my synesthesia doesn't let me paint without tasting it in my head. I prefer the computer, it doesn't happen as much. So I started trying out new sorts of digital artwork and I also made some music. MRI machines, I took the noise and I turned that into music, put it to visuals with a student who wanted a part of a project and we did this. Some of them said to me in our first meeting, which went from one hour booked to four or five hours actually, how would you represent the fact that you're able to see the bigger picture and not just the detail? Because here's another autism myth, that we can't cope with the bigger picture, we've lost in the detail. I said that's easy, we make a modular synthesizer. I have to know what each bit does, but by itself that's useless. Because if I don't know how the bigger picture goes and I'll wire it up, I won't get a sound out of it. And it was to demonstrate systemizing input, action, output. So we did that as a big performance. And we projected the videos on the back using video mapping. So, through Simon, I had, a phone call, I had an email saying, a friend of mine wants to meet me. Now Simon was the first person who ever told me the way I thought was wrong. It was good. Everyone else says you can't think like that. Okay. The theatre director was making a play about synesthesia. He wanted me to tell him what synesthesia was like and to be with him and influence him. This is one of the artworks I made in Paris. And this was a play, playing in astonishment, and it was Peter Brook. And I worked with Catherine Hunter and Marcelo to describe how to them, just by living with them, what it was like to be a synesthetic and autistic. It's about memory and things like that. And it was Peter Brook who told me I needed to write plays and perform. So now I deal with that as well. <laughs> I'll rush through these. We've got a couple of minutes there. The next project that led on from all of this, actually it led on from flags, because someone made Enid Blyton flags in Enid Blyton Drive. And someone saw that and liked it so much they said, John, Magna Carta. Celebration of 2015, we'd like you to do the digital element of the Magna Carta celebrations. Okay, so we made uh, an app you could use on the phone. It's since died, I'm afraid you can't do it now. And what we did was you could look up streets and work out whether they've been named after someone. And the whole point was to encourage people to vote because you know we're talking parliament, not party political. This is Parliament, not Poverty. So this was a non-sectarian project funded by the Speaker's Art Fund, John, John Burke. And people could find their streets in their area, see if they were probably named after someone, but more importantly, tell us about streets that were named after people who had made a difference and we didn't know about it. Because that's what it was about, people who make a difference. Because anybody can stand up and make a difference. Like your vote counts. Everybody says my vote counts, and no one can vote. So here we go, we got information, we worked with the National Portrait Gallery, the National Archives, and the Parliamentary Archives. So you got information about who it was, and people sent me the streets they wanted, and I made artwork out the patterns of the streets. And posters. And there's Queen Victoria and Queen Elizabeth II. And my favourite one, well, Guy Fawkes Street, the only on, the last honest man to go to Parliament. We'll get something there. And this is one of my favourite rules for going dry. There is one in the country, um, and there's a poet, he's the one who's influenced me most. Died within the last week of the war. Games of the War Sports, number 14. I'm not commute, by the way. Peter told me that I needed to write about my personal experience and what I haven't told you is I was very ill at this time. So he, I was commissioned, he, Peter said write a play about your engagement with me. I 
okay. Right to play about synesthesia. He said, okay. So I went away and thought about it. In a chance meeting with someone, they said, what are you doing there? And I said, I'm making performances. Would you write one on crossing boundaries? And I said, yes. Submitted it to him. He said, I like this. You'll be coming to Venice to perform for the Queen in 2024. We want it. Okay. It's called Games of the Wars Horse. I do it in the round. It's the story of how I got PTSD. It's the story of synesthesia, working with Peter Brook, and my uncle's story, who was sunk by the Japanese in 1942. He survived, but had PTSD the rest of his life. But it's told from the Japanese pilot's point of view, and the whole thing is wrapped up in Japanese metaphor about water horses and dragons. To an autistic person, water is the most alluring and deadly thing possible. So there we go, games of the water horse. Doing it in Harrow next week and then Cambridge Science Festival will sign in the weekend. It's not all been plain sailing. You know, your worlds can get shattered. You know, I have PTSD. My first bout of PTSD was 2011 through an accident. My second bout of PTSD was 2014 through someone being violent to me. I love that picture at the end there. Now, sometimes my head is so full and I'm not recovered yet. And you know, mental health is probably the biggest barrier to neurodivergent artists. You know, the way we're treated from a year dot affects us the rest of our lives. That has to stop. Number one, I'll tell you this one quickly. I did an event in 2006. Unfortunately, the pictures I made commemorating a certain historic event have been purloined and now on the internet is the real thing. This. That's my picture. Everyone retweets it as a Hiroshima victim. I have to go to Japan and say sorry. It wasn't my fault that I made it. So if you look on Twitter or you look on the internet and type in Hiroshima shadow, it's my picture you see, not real. What am I going to do after this? More portraits, I hope. More digital landscape. 